If you wanted to move over a billion people across a country the size of the United States, but with four times the population, how would you do it? Would you build more highways, more airports, or would you try something entirely different, something faster, cheaper, cleaner, and far more efficient? China chose trains, and not just a few. In less than two decades, it built the largest high-speed rail network in the world, stretching over 45,000 kilometers, connecting megacities and remote villages alike. Today, you can travel from Beijing to Shanghai, a distance similar from New York to Chicago, in under five hours. And there's no TSA, no middle seats, no endless delays. Just fast, frequent, and surprisingly affordable trains. Hundreds of them, departing every single day. But how did China manage this? How did it go from a modest railway system to one that moves more people each year than the populations of Europe and the Americas combined? This is the story of how China connected 1.4 billion people with trains. To understand how China pulled off one of the most ambitious transportation projects in human history, we need to go back not just a few years, but more than a century. Railways in China began under very different circumstances. In 1876, a British company built a short railway from Shanghai to Wusong, just nine miles long. It was China's first commercial rail line, but the Qing government never approved it. Just 16 months after opening, Chinese officials dismantled the entire line. At the time, trains were seen as foreign intrusions, noisy, dangerous, and unnecessary. And the experiment was over before it really began. That pretty much set the tone for the early years. Trains were foreign machines, imposed by colonial powers during a time when China had little say over its own future. By 1911, there were just 9,000 kilometers of rail lines, many of them owned and operated by outsiders. And even as the rest of the world was racing ahead with steel and steam, China was held back by internal strife, warlords, civil wars, and invasions that made national projects nearly impossible. When the People's Republic was founded in 1949, the country had only about 22,000 kilometers of usable railway. For a country this size, that was almost nothing. But the new government saw trains not as foreign threats, but as essential tools. Trains could move coal, move grain, and, more importantly, move people. People from rural villages to industrial hubs. People from the interior to the coast. People from isolation into opportunity. Through the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, railway construction became a national priority. Tracks were laid across deserts, over mountains, and through valleys where no one thought trains could run. They were not fast. Many trains averaged just 40 to 60 kilometers per hour, but they reached deep into the country, often for the first time. The goal wasn't speed, it was access. By the 1990s, China's railway network had tripled in length, but even with more tracks, demand far outpaced supply. The economy was growing fast, people were on the move, and the system was constantly overloaded. Tickets were hard to get, trains were packed, delays were common, and yet, the entire country still relied on them. It was clear something had to change, and that change came not from tweaking the old system, but from building something completely new. The Chinese economy was growing at double digits. Cities were expanding. Hundreds of millions of people were traveling farther and more frequently than ever before. Freight rail was jammed. Passenger rail was sold out weeks in advance. And even after five speed-up campaigns and tens of thousands of kilometers of new track, the national railway system still had one problem it couldn't solve. Time. The trains were still too slow. At the same time, other countries had already moved on. Japan's Shinkansen had been running since 1964. France's TGV was crossing the country at over 270 kilometers per hour. Spain, Germany, and South Korea were investing in next-gen high-speed lines. China, despite having one of the biggest rail networks in the world, had nothing that could compare. So in 2004, the government approved a new plan, not to improve the existing system, but to build a new one from scratch, a high-speed network network based on international standards, built for fast, frequent, long-distance travel at speeds between 200 and 350 kilometers per hour. It was called the Mid to Long Term Railway Network Plan, and it called for the creation of thousands of kilometers of passenger dedicated high speed lines, completely separate from existing freight and mixed use routes. No other country had attempted something at this scale before, and certainly not this fast. But there was one problem. China didn't yet have the technology to do it alone. So the Ministry of Railways struck deals with international companies. It partnered with Siemens from Germany, Alstom from France, Bombardier from Canada, and Kawasaki from Japan. In exchange for massive contracts, those firms agreed to transfer key technologies to Chinese manufacturers. These joint ventures formed the basis of what would eventually become China's domestic high-speed train industry. And it didn't take long for China to catch up. In August 2008, 
Just days before the Beijing Olympics, China opened its first true high-speed rail line, the Beijing-Tianjin Intercity Railway. It stretched 117 kilometers, with trains running at speeds of up to 350 kilometers per hour, cutting travel time from 70 minutes to just under 30. The launch was a test of technology, infrastructure, and operations, and it worked. Trains ran on time. Riders were impressed. The system held up under pressure, and most importantly, it proved that China could operate a world-class high-speed rail service. Less than a year later, the government approved a national rollout. In 2009, China had just 1,300 kilometers of high-speed rail in service. By 2012, that number grew to over 9,000. By 2015, it crossed 19,000. And by 2020, China had built more than 35,000 kilometers of high-speed rail, more than the rest of the world combined. No country had ever built anything like it, and certainly not in that amount of time. The key was scale. Most countries build one or two high-speed lines and operate them as individual projects. China built an entire network, a grid of dedicated high-speed corridors that connected nearly every major city in the country. It was called the Eight Vertical and Eight Horizontal Plan, Eight North-South Lines, Eight East-West, designed to form a national backbone of rapid transit, allowing people to travel thousands of kilometers at airplane speeds, but with train convenience. The cornerstone of this system was the Beijing-Shanghai High-Speed Railway, which opened in June 2011. It stretched 1,318 kilometers, one of the longest high-speed lines in the world, and cost about $33 billion at the time. Trains ran at 300 to 350 kilometers per hour, slashing the travel time from 10 hours to under 5. Within a year, it was moving over 100 million passengers annually. By the mid-2010, high-speed rail was no longer just a government project. It had become the preferred way to travel. Tickets were affordable, averaging 0.3 to 0.5 yuan per kilometer, competitive with budget flights, and much faster than regular trains or highways. And it was efficient. A high-speed rail line can carry up to 1,000 passengers per train, with departures every 5 to 10 minutes on the busiest routes. Unlike airports, stations were in city centers, security was fast, Reporting was simple, and delays were rare, so China kept building. To support this expansion, it invested heavily in domestic train manufacturing. The joint ventures with foreign firms were phased out. By 2017, Chinese companies like CRRC Corporation were producing their own high-speed trains under the Fuxing brand, trains that were faster, lighter, and more advanced than their original foreign designs. The Fuxing CR400AF and CR400BF models are now the backbone of the network. These trains regularly operate at 350 km per hour, and during test runs, they've hit speeds over 420 km per hour. On some routes, they've cut travel times by more than half. What once took a full day can now be done in a morning. And China didn't stop at just building trains. It built new stations, new bridges, new tunnels. The Danyang Kunshan Grand Bridge, which carries the Beijing Shanghai Line, is the longest bridge in the world, stretching over 164 kilometers across rivers, rice paddies, and flood zones. In mountainous regions, entire sections of rail were built on stilts or bored through solid rock. On the Guiyang Guangzhou Line, over 80% of the route consists of bridges and tunnels, built to keep speeds consistent in terrain that would have been impassable just decades earlier. By 2023, China's high-speed rail network reached over 42,000 kilometers, with trains serving 96% of cities over 500,000 people. More than 2.5 billion passenger trips were recorded in a single year, a number that exceeds the total annual air traffic of the entire United States. In just two decades, China went from having no high-speed rail at all to having more than the rest of the world combined. And the story doesn't end there. As of 2025, China's high-speed rail network has passed 48,000 kilometers, already more than the rest of the world combined, and the government is on track to exceed 50,000 kilometers by the end of the year. The next goal is clear, 70,000 kilometers by 2035, covering nearly every city with more than 500,000 people, and gradually increasing maximum operating speeds from 350 to 400 kilometers per hour. At the same time, China's maglev program is moving ahead. Tests have pushed beyond 650 kilometers per hour and full-scale prototypes are already running in Qingdao and Changsha. And in Datong, engineers are now testing a vacuum tube maglev designed for 1,000 km per hour. If it works, a Beijing-Shanghai trip could take just 90 minutes. High-speed rail might get the attention, but it's not the whole picture. For every bullet train slicing across the country at 350 km per hour, there are dozens of slower trains moving just as steadily. China's conventional rail system still forms the backbone of the national network. 
As of today, China has around 158,000 kilometers of total railway track. Of that, roughly 110,000 kilometers are conventional. While high-speed lines are dedicated to passengers, these conventional lines are mixed use. They connect cities, towns, rural provinces, and industrial zones that high-speed rail doesn't always reach. And they're busy. Each year, China's conventional passenger rail lines carry over 1.4 billion trips. These are the green trains, the ones with hard seats, sleeper bunks, and longer journey times. They aren't flashy, but they're essential. For many people in rural areas or lower-income travelers, they remain the most affordable way to travel long distances. Some routes take 20 to 40 hours, but a hard sleeper from Chongqing to Harbin, for example, a trip of over 2,600 kilometers, costs under 400 wen, that's about 55 US dollars. For millions of workers heading home during the holidays or students traveling across provinces, this is still the best, and sometimes the only, option. Then there's the freight. In 2023, China's railways moved over 4.9 billion tons of cargo. That includes everything from coal and iron ore to shipping containers, grain, cement, and chemicals. To put that number in perspective, it's more than the entire freight moved by every railway system in the United States, the EU, Russia, and India combined. And it's not just bulk goods. China has built dedicated freight corridors to separate cargo from passenger rail. One of the most important is the Datong Qinhuangdao Railway, which moves coal from the mines of Shanxi to the ports of Hebei. This single line alone moves over 400 million tons of coal per year, more than most national rail systems move in total. On some freight routes, trains stretch for over 2 kilometers, carrying more than 10,000 tons per run, and many of these corridors are now electrified and automated, reducing both cost and emissions. Then there's the Qinghai-Tibet Railway, which is not just a symbol of engineering. It's a functional lifeline. It delivers food, fuel, and construction materials to Tibet year-round. Before it was built, almost everything had to be flown in or hauled by truck on narrow, winding mountain roads. Now, entire regions rely on it for survival. Meanwhile, China's international freight rail system has quietly become one of the most important logistics tools in Eurasia. Since the first test train left Chongqing for Duisburg, Germany in 2011, the number of China-Europe freight trains has grown from just 17 per year to over 17,000 per year as of 2024. These routes stretch over 13,000 kilometers, cross through Kazakhstan, Russia, Belarus, and Poland, and deliver containers to over 200 cities in 25 countries across Europe. The journey takes 12 to 18 days, faster than ships, cheaper than air freight, and far more stable than many expected when it first launched. As of 2024, the China-Europe Rail Service has officially passed its 100,000th trip milestone. These freight routes also serve as political and economic tools. They're part of the Belt and Road Initiative, linking inland cities like Xi'an, Zhengzhou, and Urumqi directly to global markets. For manufacturers in central or western China, this means goods can reach European customers without ever seeing a seaport. Domestically, freight rail is what keeps factories running. Steel from Hebei goes to construction sites in Chongqing. Grain from Heilongjiang is sent to Guangdong. Auto parts from Changchun are shipped to assembly plants in Shanghai. Coal from Inner Mongolia powers power stations in Shandong, and it all moves by train. Rail freight in China accounts for about 15% of total cargo movement by volume. Trucks still dominate short and mid-range logistics, especially in areas not yet served by rail. So the government is now investing in dedicated freight rail corridors, like the Western Land Sea New Corridor through Chongqing and Guangxi, and upgrading older routes to handle higher axle loads and longer trains. The goal is to reduce highway congestion, lower emissions, and make rail the go-to option for heavy, long-distance cargo. Freight may not be as sleek as a 350 km per hour bullet train, but without it, the economy stops. High-speed rail in China isn't just transportation, it's urban planning, it's national strategy, and in many places, it's the reason a city exists at all. Unlike in many countries, where rail gets built to connect cities that already exist, China often does it the other way around. First, the government selects a location, then it builds the station, then the roads, then the business district, then the housing, then the schools, and by the time the high-speed trains start running, a new city center has already taken shape. This model is called transit-oriented development. But in China, it goes far beyond just putting apartments near stations. In many cities, entire districts have been built around rail hubs, with the rail line acting as the anchor 
anchor for schools, hospitals, government offices, and commercial towers. Take Xi'an North Station. 20 years ago, the land around it was mostly farmland. Today, it's a financial zone with malls, tech parks, residential towers, and direct connections to the local metro. The same is true in Zhengzhou East, Nanning East, Chengdu East, and dozens more. China didn't just connect cities, it connected lives, 1.4 billion of them, with trains. But what does this mean for the rest of the world? Is this model possible elsewhere, or is it something only China could pull off? Let us know what you think in the comments below.